course it's a very serious thing. But there are other things, especially in Greece, that are more serious. Why is more serious? More people are killed by traffic accidents in Greece, by influenza, rather than by coronavirus. It's a very serious, we have to take precautions, but we should not panic, especially the people that they have the diagnosis, they have the knowledge. So I prepared that, just because, uh, uh, and of course I have uploaded new and new versions, because I uploaded yesterday and I received four comments, just to see, from the to see how important they is. Now, those that they don't know the Athens Institute for Education and Research, just to say that this is our 25th year, it's our silver anniversary. We have organized um, such events, maybe more than 1,000, and they have participated more than 30,000 academics from more than 120 different countries. So the idea of making Greece or Athens, if you want, a place where people can come from all over the world and exchange ideas, the 25 years of our existence, I think, can be considered as a success. Not a great success, but as a success. And of course, we can continue improving. As I said in our website, we say that Athenair, the last 25 years, has a non-Euclidean improvement. That means sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. Now let me come to the idea of philoxenia and xenophobia in ancient Greece. This is an old problem. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we made a mistake and we printed an earlier version of the program. The of, but this is the new one. It has been uploaded so you can see it. Now, let me explain that a number of terms that we have to explain. One thing, you have my paper as well. What does philoxenia mean? Usually, people, philoxenia means is the idea, is the philosophy. It says means friend of xenia, of hospitality. So I like the idea of hospitality. And uh, the second thing, or parallel to that third, is theoxenia. Theoxenia is, as an idea, it's God. It's the God that uh, you, as we say sometimes, we provide uh, God services. So it's a luxury service. So in Greece, you find the word philoxenia throughout the uh, documents coming from the Homer or his seal, the words are mentioned, that uh, view Greeks, supposedly, they were philoxenes, which is another, uh, where I have the term, I don't have it here, uh, we'll find it later. Philoxenes means that I'm a friend of a foreigner. Philoxenia is the idea, and philoxenes means that I'm a friend of, uh, uh, of, of a foreigner. Xenophilia, not I have it. Xenophilia means friends with the foreigner I have here. And xenophobia is exactly the opposite, which is the title of my uh, paper. So we have xenophilia and xenophobia. Both, they penetrate the English language, I don't know in Italian if it's the same, we can use the, the word, but both, is it xenophobia in Italian as well? The term? Yes. Yes. You see, you, you came here as an imperialist and you stole our language. Now, <laughs> xenophilia, xenophobia, the two terms. Now, and of course, my argument is that the ancient Greeks were not xenophilus, they were xenophobic. And this is, this, is, uh, this is the argument that can be, can be debated. And if I want to take it one step further, all the world is xenophobic, you will see. So it's very difficult, especially under these circumstances, See what happens now with uh, in ancient um, uh, history. I mentioned to my friends uh, that come outside Greece to give this. He mentioned in his Peloponnesian War that when the plague started in Athens 430 BCE, originally they said it came from Egypt. So it was someone else to blame. But if you read a skills, the suppliers, there is a group of people that come from Egypt and they claim that they have a Greek origin. So that was their, they didn't want to accept, it's like the minor, the refugees. But they say, but we are Greeks. And they relate that to their uh, history or the mythology. Now, in any way, <coughs> xenophobic behavior, you'll find it since antiquity. Of course, um, 
put it this since we will not believe that the Egyptians brought the play, they said Spartans them. So it's another thing that, of course, they were Greeks, but they were not Athenian. So someone else was blamed. And since Spartans, they say they put the, the vials into the wells of Piraeus, then someone pointed out, that's the stylized fact, someone pointed out that uh, Piraeus doesn't have wells. So they say it's God. God gave uh, the vials to Pinesa and so on and so forth. We see the same things uh, uh, appear again. Now, it was ancient Greeks that made this um, distinction between Greek and barbarians. You have the same word in uh, all languages, I don't know if they name barbarian. Barbarian means non-Greek, actually. Why? I'll explain to you. It's because of the way that they were talking, nobody understood them or the level of their language skills was so low, so that's why they was called barbarian. But this dichotomy between Greek and barbarian, they had to explain it. So what are the criteria to separate someone from um, being Greek or non-Greek? The first thing is language. And that we have in English language the word senolaya, that means a foreign language. Uh, voice, language, yes. and we have Bar Barofum. So he's talking, he has a voice of uh, a barbarian. <coughs> so that's one like Pedia education, I'll come back to that because this is very important. So education, and this is true in ancient times, not all Greeks though, only the Athenians, they had the Pedia, the education to teach the world. In my paper you will see I mentioned that the Spartans <coughs> They didn't accept that people should be educated. They said, for us, a minimum level of education and being a good soldier is what we require. So it was not accepted. This is because I'm going to say later that the education became the demarcation line between um, Greeks and non-Greeks. And <coughs> of course, there was a the a pan Hellenic character, I call it. I, didn't, I couldn't find a better word. There was something that joined them together. What joins you together? If you participate in common activities, Pan's Olympic Games. Only Greeks could participate in Olympic Games. And that, the fact that you participate in the Olympic Games, qualified you as being Greek. So if you want someone said he's a barbarian, like they said about the Macedonians, for example, you say, no, no, they're not barbarians because we allow them to participate in the Olympic Games. So one of the criteria to be called Greek is whether you were allowed to participate in the Olympic Games. But the Olympic Games was only one of the things. We know since the period of 800 BCE that there were there were poetry contests. We know one between Isilde and Homer. We don't know if it is true, but there was a contest, poetry contest, or the Panathenia in, in ancient Athens. It was something which was not games, but was cultural event. Again, Greeks, or the city-states that they, they, they were alive, they were allowed to participate. Now, so the three criteria I'm repeating. You must have a common language, you must have an education, you must participate in common events like the Olympic Games. Now, the importance of language has been emphasized so much by Ross. I have the reference, 2005. He knew this is, I'm, I'm putting that reference because it's very important. He said, the reason that the Trojans lost the war is because they cannot communicate between themselves, but because they didn't speak the same language. Presumably the Trojans, who not here, were Greeks, or at least they speak fluently Greek, but all the Greek army, coming from very different countries, they were speaking the same language. Why? Because they were able to communicate. And Ross argues that that gave them an advantage, because if you give an order, then everybody can implement. So they understood each other. Some of them, they came from my village. Even modern Greeks, when I speak Greek, don't understand me because I have this local accent. Uh, can you 
you imagine 2,500 years ago that some people, they were talking between Cretans and uh, a, a Western Greece. So it was, there was an accent, but they could communicate. And uh, it, called, it has a very good word, which is in English as well, cacophony. Cacophony means that the Trojan army could not communicate. They had people that they didn't speak Greek. So they were foreign. They were barbarians, in other words. So language is one thing. Now, Homer uses the language as a criteria to distinguish between barbarians and Hellens or Greeks. But it was Herodotus that developed, that took that argument of the language and made it the best ever definition that we have for an ethnicity. Still today, and it's debatable, what is an Italian, what is an Egyptian, what is a Greek, what is a Canadian, what is American? The definition of Herodotus applies, and we can debate it. This is the definition. The I'm using uh, the word that uh, he uses, uh, in brackets is the ancient Greek word. You must have the same blood. <coughs> when I was in Canada, because I'm a Canadian citizen, I said, what do you mean you are Canadian? According to Herodotus, we don't have the same blood. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the same blood, you cannot call your... So Canadian ethnicity doesn't exist. According to Herodotus. <laughs> the same thing applies to the American. I mean, if you go to New York, I lived in New York, most of them like, they are Italians. And there are some people, they call, they are not Italian, but they look Italian. Who knows what happened during the night? No? So this is, uh, and New York, they speak more than 100 and something. And they call all themselves, it's amazing what they have succeeded, the melting pot, all themselves they call the American. And they are proud, of course, of their heritage, but they call themselves American. So are they... If you are an Italian that you come from New York, in Italy, for example, how do you accept him? Do you accept him as a foreigner, as a non-Italian, or as an Italian? He has a lot of money, I'm sure, as an Italian. Now, the same language, I mentioned that, the same gods, that's another issue that he brought, and the same way of life or civilization. So this is the four criteria. I think if we apply today, it can they can be applied today to identify ethnicity, Greekness and non-Greekness, Egyptian and non-Egyptian. Arab, I don't know. Arab is an, an ethnicity or is uh, more than that? Lifestyle. Huh? Lifestyle. Yeah. Lifestyle, culture. Yeah. Now, let me skip to one word that has created a lot of controversy. This is not an English word, but it's uh, xenelasia means it's very difficult to define, but let me start with a very strong definition. It's kick out, kick out the strangers. It was applied in Sparta. Now, there are two views. One view says, we don't like them, and we say, don't come, or they expel them. But there's a strong view, and we have the evidence I give it in the paper, that they kick them out. They beat them. They hit them. Now, I have an inter my own interpretation there. I give you one interpretation. You know, the Trojan War, if I want to link it, you know what was the excuse for having the Trojan War? The excuse was that there was a beautiful Spartan girl, Helen, that happened to be the wife of the king of Sparta, Menelo. And the beautiful guy from Troy came to Sparta and he was welcomed. He, Menelaus was a good hostess for him. And unfortunately, in Paris, he stole his wife and they ran away. Gorgias is an ancient philosopher, has four or five good reasons why we should not blame Helen for what it happened. But if you were Menelos, and if you are Spartan, someone comes and uh, steals your wife, I'm sure you will be not a friend of foreigners. So that word start, that's the myth, of course. I don't believe this is a real excuse. Try a word coming, but for other reasons. So I'm using that interpretation that uh, there were good reasons why Spartans, there are other reasons as well, why Spartans were practicing Xenilasia. 
Now, I'm just giving a quote. This is from like the morning polythea by Xenophon. By the way, Xenophon, Xen is foreign. His name, Xenophon, the great historian, philosopher, whatever you want to name. His name is the word straight, it's foreigner, Xen. And of course, there are two interpretations about the form. One is form which is, uh, can come from uh, light, oh, the other is from voice. So both words have been translated in, in, um, in English. Now, what he claims here, he gives an excuse, an explanation, which is very relevant today. What he says, it affects modern tourism. What are the negative impacts of modern tourism? What is the impact on local societies from mass tourism? The argument that they make is that changes the culture. It affects the way that locals live. It destroys their traditional way of life. Foreigners are coming and they change the lifestyle. It's exactly what Xenophon said to justify an opinion, by the way, to justify why the Spartans did not like foreigners. He said more than that. We don't like them because they come and spy. And since it was a military state, they want to make sure that their secrets, especially that they were very, very few, will not be known by their uh, enemies. So there are two things. One thing is the myth, the other is to protect your own way of life. On the other hand, there is this quotation, and I think, it, about the Athenian. If you read, as I mentioned before, the Thucydides, Thucydides narrates a story during the first war of the Peloponnesian War, which is well known, especially in the United States, which is the Pericles Oration. That was given to honor the first death of the Peloponnesian War. There Pericles says that our city is open to the world so everybody can come, see and learn. And he used the word xenilasia, that we don't kick the foreigners out, but why? Not because they were friends of foreigners, but because they were superior than foreigners. If you, since everybody quotes this, but they don't quote the phrase after. He says, Athens, it was, it was actually after the Persian War. Athenians, they built a big Persian empire. So they were very arrogant. They were very proud, if you want to use another word. So they say, we are not scared. We don't really care if foreigners come here and learn from us, because we have nothing to hide. We rely on our own education system. We rely on our own culture that is so strong, so superior to others, so we are not scared. So everybody can come and uh, check on us. Greeks were xenophobic. They were the ones who coined the term barbarian, which is still used today by many other ethnicities, which themselves are xenophobic. If Greeks showed xenophobic, xenophile behavior, this was done either because they feared the punishment from God, I didn't mention that, but this is uh, another important issue, and or they were expecting material gains. Now, that uh, ends my presentation. Uh, we're going to start, of course I have the paper you can read, we're going to start the first uh, session right away, and I'd like the first speaker to take uh, the podium, speak for 10 minutes, impress the world, because there is the world, so it's Everybody's looking for you and not here. So thank you very much. You want 15 minutes? You have to pay more. Though. <laughs> <laughs> we sell. We sell. I will sell. I will sell, I will sell them. Okay, enjoy the 15 more minutes because we're gonna pay more for living. <laughs>
Well, um, first of all, um, just a, a call for the attention because the tourism index really differs from other many index rates. For example, um, the destinations, oh, sorry, the destinations um, uh, have some components that affect those destinations. So um, this is one of the objectives <coughs> of tourism activity, and it's so different. For example, when we're looking for the, the pricing strategy. Uh, we have many articles, we have many theoretical components in the world. Uh, for example, um, a few, a few uh, weeks ago, another uh, research presented a new um, point of view about the price in the hospitality. Uh, because um, we are in a symposium from Ottawa and local hospitality. And this, this, this work is so interesting. For example, they developed some clusters, uh, and with these clusters, uh, they can identify, for example, uh, some clusters with the airport distance, if you are near or not so near from the airport. They identify another one, for example, about the highway exit. If you have an highway exit near your hotel, so you can define, define some clusters. And for example, about the um, seven, seven, seven tourist, most, tourist, uh, most important tourism attractions. For example, if, if your hotel is near seven more, most important tourism attractions in the, in the region. So, you can develop some clusters, and with these clusters, you can define, define the, the, some price. But don't forget that, uh, like um, Hilton, the managers, of the, the CEO of the Hilton Hotels, they told that the most important in a hotel is location, location, and location. So uh, don't forget this, because you can move your hotel. So you need to select very well your investment when you buy a new auto, when you buy a, uh, you will start a your, the, the new building for auto because you cannot move the auto. But be, be attention that when you compare the autos with the Airbnb units, um, this is more substantial attention for the urban auto. So take attention with this, this information. And um, don't forget that you have the competition with all over the world. When we talk about hospitality, all over the world, you have are in competition, and don't forget the external factors. Because nowadays, uh, the managers need taking a strategic decisions in a long way. Don't forget the external factors. <clears throat> when we talk about tourism entrepreneurs, we uh, need thinking the new tourism for new tourists. For example, nowadays it's very usual you find some tourists with the smartphones, and they they can use, for example, the promotion. Uh, they get access to the promotion in the smartphone. So the strategy for the, the new entrepreneurs in tourism must take attention for the, these new technologies. And uh, you have some, some papers nowadays talking about the smartphones and uh, how can they help the, tourist, the local tourism experience. So um, we have nowadays some information about the, this technology. Looking for um, the, the, the local impacts uh, nowadays, it's much more important uh, the strategy focusing in, in the authenticity in the place where you develop your promotion. For example, looking for this, this case in Thailand uh, in the last year, 2019, um, they developed a work uh, to be a local artist for a day. And the tourists can develop the, the, some, some, with some creativity um, the, some typical from this region, and then they, they, they have some parties with the, this creativity developed by uh, the, in a creative tourism development. So um, that's very important, and they can have a very great impact in the, in the, in the tourism. Uh, so don't forget that for all this strategy, the tourism entrepreneurs must look for the local partners like a team. Sometimes the partners in near the, this place are uh, a good team to promote local experience. For example, just walk in the best place, just tell, tell, tell something about the histories, tell something about the traditions, for example, some intangible culture, so that's very important. If you look for a, a, a great, for me, I, I, I find this article, for me it's, it's amazing because it's a, a, like a looking for the Airbnb paradox because sometimes we're looking for the hospitality and looking for the hotel um, talking about um, some danger uh, 
um, activities. And some people talking about auto and then the Airbnb, it's not, com it's not, uh, have not a good connection. And in this article, um, you can find a positive uh, effect in hospitality in industry. For example, in the employment, it's interesting. This article, uh, the sample focuses in 12 major metro metropolitan statistical in U.S. Um, in some cities like Boston, Washington, um, New York, San Francisco, and so on. And the data was collected. The, the data analysis um, was 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 analyzed during. Uh, 12, uh, 10 years from 2018-2018. So, um, why these areas? Um, because these comprise the major city in hospitality in the US and uh, the, the top performance in the Airbnb and uh, so um, they have previous studies to compare the results. Uh, they use uh, an alternative measures because they only consider the, the Airbnb listings that have previous 12 months in, um, in activity, with, with some sales in the 12 last months. Uh, and the empirical findings, it's, it was amazing. That, for example, for uh, 100 Airbnb listing created, approximately 1.5 jobs were created in the, in the in old industry. So that's very important. And you can find more results, for example, uh, if you look 1.5 uh, impact uh, in, in, the, in the employment, uh, not only in rooms, in, in, in general, so 1.5 more uh, in the, the, the employer <coughs> uh, development. So the results present a new ways to looking for this hotel and Airbnb. Before you looking like a parabolic correlations, but nowadays you can even find like a linear uh, correlation. So it's very interesting because maybe it can help. And why it happens? It happens because with the Airbnb platform experience, for example, you can provide additional um, employment for the sector with uh, some other activities that are compatible, that are not in, in a competition, but they are compatible. So um, it's very interesting. If you need to um, consider the, the most important conclusions, well, for me, I, I will summarize the most important conclusion that the, the debate the, the, sorry the sorry the debate uh, will I'm so sorry okay uh, will be continuous because some people um, have a, a, a good opinion about the Airbnb and the auto activity some people tell it's impossible stay with hotel and Airbnb in the same region, some people fight with the government to put more rules and some people... So, as you can see, you have many opinions, but in, in the end, you need to think more solutions. I will finish in a few minutes, just talk uh, about the promotion, the importance of the promotion, and I will give you an example about my country. Uh, in my country, we look for the agenda, the sustainable development agenda, uh, and Looking for that, we, we developed some promotion. For example, uh, some activities that are, have sustainability. For example, a few years ago, we have a, an American guy that, uh, McNamara, that uh, they, have a, they are served the biggest wave in the world with recognition for the, the world records. So we, are, um, we have many promotion about that in, in the Times, in the, the CNN, in the, the Guardian. So in many places in the world, talking about this, important in the surf. With all this, we, we, we have now the, the world, the, one of the biggest world competitions in, in the country, because you know, sometimes you have the promotion, and with this promotion you will generate more business, one of the biggest competition in the world. Uh, and of course, uh, in the same way, we have not only the promotion, but the government can give you some tools to develop more entrepreneurship activity. Nowadays, in my country, you can create your company immediately, in a, a few minutes. In average, you can create a company in 42 minutes, in 56 seconds. And the only amount that you need is one euro. So, you can start a company uh, around the hospitality, around the tourism, in um, very quickly. Uh, dear President, just one or two more minutes. A case study to show this, one year only this uh, is a uh, 
uh, uh, entrepreneur that before have a hotel and still now have a hotel, but in the same day, in the same time they have a hotel and now the Airbnb concept, the same entrepreneur. So they develop these concepts uh, with a sustainable, sustainability policies. Seventy percent of the water came from the, uh, the, the hot came from solar energy. Uh, the water is used for the the the, the irrigating the garden. The waste manager, they, they, they produce vegetables to, to use by the, the, the customers. The, they have transfer, uh, trans, transversal measures. For example, the, the customers, uh, they can uh, relate uh, active, some activities to, to sustainability, <coughs> for example, cleaning the beach. And, uh, for example, the operation, everything <coughs> is reused. So nothing is lost, everything is transformed. And including the construction, in the top of the roof, you can see some local, local species that contribute for the air conditioning. So, today, today morning, today in the morning, I checked the sun news, today morning. Uh, and this news, uh, today morning, uh, you can find uh, in, the, in the garden, today in the morning, that we have some, pr some, some problems nowadays. Uh, today in the morning, the Boeing uh, has some, some problems now with, with some uh, flights, with some uh, some festivities are cancelled nowadays, and the economists they have a, a nice article you can read from the economists um, talking about this problem. And it's not only in all over the world, including here. You have today some news today about the same problem. So, just to finish, considering the new challenges, um, the hotel and local hospitality, I think the most important is think in what's next. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. the Mediterraneans that they don't give time, but you are excellent example of an exception. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, our next speaker that uh, he will uh, prove for that Egyptians as well, they can keep up time with the Portuguese. Now, the idea is that please make notes if you want to make comments or questions about our participants. And I have a suggestion. Uh, maybe we can go all the problem through. It's easier, so we'll have more time before the opening event. And uh, at the end, of course, we'll have more discussion. So the next session will be chaired by Professor Zurida. Uh, yes, he's here. And uh, he will take over. Okay. So we don't have a break. Let's continue. And uh, with all the presentations, and then we can have the discussion. Uh, by the way, I have one euro here. <laughs> you for the you can stop your company. You can stop the company. The company. Yeah. The company. Yeah. 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 For the company. Yeah. For the company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Hassan from Egypt. I'd like to say <coughs> thank you again because this is the first, the second time in Athena. Actually, the first time was in 2014. It was a uh, paper presented. I'd like to thank uh, Her Excellency Professor Sabrine for actually because he's the one who initiated the topic. I'm a specialist in Coptic and Islamic architecture. Little, yeah, something a little bit far from such kind of, you know, uh, uh, Tourism marketing topics. Architecture and tourism, they go to <laughs> Okay. So the topic will be about boutique hotels and uh, local hospitality, a new approach to promote cultural heritage of uh, hosting communities. Uh, actually, when we started, uh, me and Professor Sabrina, when we started to, uh, to initiate the topic, our objective was like we want to identify to which extent. Uh, boutique hotel can be used as a tool for marketing the cultural heritage of the hosting community and to detect the factors that motivates the guests to use such a kind of accommodation. Uh, so if we just started with this question, what are the reasons has given the birth to such kind of concept or uh, the new concept of accommodation market? I'm talking here uh, specifically about Egypt. Uh, you know that cultural heritage, when it comes to marketing, is one of the most important motivators for tourists to undertake or to choose a certain destination to, to be visited. So, 
Although Egypt is very famous for its cultural heritage, according to the uh, statistics that has been issued by the Ministry of Tourism, 94% of our inbound tourism is leisure tourism, and 6% is different kind of tourism, including uh, heritage tourism or cultural tourism. So we are losing our competitive advantage. We need something to revive our heritage again, because it's our competitive advantage. Each and every country has the sun and sea and, and so on. But only Egypt has Tutankhamun, has Temple of Luxor, Temple, Temple of Karnak, so we have competitive advantage. Uh, okay, uh, we have just a very quick uh, general look on the uh, accommodation sector in Egypt. We have 280,000 rooms scattered all over the, uh, the country. It's diversified between five star hotels, four star hotels, three star hotels, and so on. But when we started to our topic, we have this question. Has this sector managed to contribute to the sustainability of the tourism sector and marketing of the Egyptian heritage or not? Did we manage? And in order to, 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 uh, yani, to explain to which extent did we manage to revive our heritage or to market our heritage, we just found out that most of the hotels in Egypt, when it comes to handicraft, for example, one of the most important components for intangible cultural heritage, they are explaining the Chinese products. They don't explain anymore the Egyptian handmade products. I'm talking about big number of hotels like Marriott, like Sheraton, like Hilton. It's, it's the big chain. And this, they started also to showcase the folkloric music and dance, which is related to different you know, uh, different uh, civilization, different countries. So we have now the Ukrainian uh, show, the, mute, the, the Russian show, and so on. <coughs> Even the cuisine. We have shifted from the traditional cuisine into the more international cuisine. So we are losing our heritage. So the sector doesn't contribute at all to the sustainability of to the sustainability of the industry, tourism industry, or the local community. This means, and guess what? The local community, in a research, the benefit of the local community for whom the accommodation sector and food and beverage sector doesn't exceed 13% of the total revenue of the tourism. This means that we have a problem. Because when we talk about the craft, the craft sector, we find that like the blue poor income for the uh, local community exceeded like or like 55% of the total revenue of tourism. So accommodation and food and beverage, when we say that it's the maximum was like 13% for the local economy, this means that it is not sustainable industry. Because if you want to make sustainable, you have to have the local economy to get benefited from the sector. So, if we just look from another perspective, from the perspective of the customer himself, the customer nowadays, he doesn't or she doesn't need like a standard service. They, they need like a customized service, a personalized service. They need a story to tell when they go back to their country. So, this is uh, actually the reason that made the boutique hotels uh, gave an access to the hospitality industry, uh, Egyptian hospitality industry. So boutique hotels, I know that there are different uh, definitions for the word boutique hotels, but for us, for me and Professor Sabrina, this is the uh, most uh, 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 selected one. Uh, boutique hotels are such kind of non-standard small hotels that offer high level of customized service. They are very unique interiors. They have very unique interior and exterior design associated with quality stuff. They are generally higher price, which are considered reasonable because of the perceived quality. Okay? So, uh, in Egypt, as I have mentioned, boutique hotels has given an access to the tourism sector. We have now uh, more than like 100 uh, hotel, boutique hotels in Egypt, located in Fayoum, in, uh, this is called Lazi and it is very difficult to distinguish between the, the hotel itself as a building, as a structure, and the, the houses of the villages, because they have adopted the same structure. 
they are not, they are very coherent. Even the uh, the interior design is they have covered the interior design of the local villages. So if you are a tourist, you have a story to tell. You have something different. You are not in a very standardized like uh, service like Marit or Sheraton, uh, which you can find everywhere in the world, by the way. Uh, in Mersam is another one in Luxor uh, Governor. You know all Luxor, I think. The biggest open air museum all over the world. So, El Marsam, also one of uh, the boutique hotels that has initiated recently in, in, in Luxor. Uh, one boutique hotel has started to, to make like a botany school for the visitor to, to practice handmade products themselves. You know, they want to enhance the experience of the visitor. Uh, the cuisine for these boutique hotels, such kind of boutique hotels, are truly Egyptian. You know, they, they never uh, provide uh, any kind of international cuisine. I know that it is, in, in terms of marketing, it is very essential to diversify your product. But, you know, the international cuisine can be found anywhere in the world. But when I go to Fayoum, for example, I want to, to feel the local. Yeah, exactly. They also give you access to, you know, this is, these are some pictures for the local, local community who participate in organizing such kind, such kind of, uh, uh, of meals. So you have the chance to, to look at them, to see the traditional way of making the bread, to, to see the traditional way of making the pancake in front of your eyes, which the matter which you will enhance your experience. The same with the beverage. This is the last point. I'm not gonna uh, go in detail. Uh, I'm not gonna go in details. Sulaya Hotel, Sulaya Hotel is one of the boutique hotels that has been rewarded by the UNWTO recently as the most uh, sustainable project in the Middle East. It's a boutique hotel, and the owner of this hotel, actually, and the investor, he started. Yeah, this is the island. It fo it's just in front of uh, a monumental island that accommodates one of the most important temples called Fiat Temple. And the investor of this island, he decided to revive the Nubian heritage. So he started by the Nubian people, the old Nubian people, to reconstruct the village again, to uh, reconstruct, to re uh, revive the Nubian meals and cuisine. And all, each and every element that has been used in this hotel are locally made, locally and environmentally, it's an eco-friendly environment. These are, you know, all the staff that has participated in, uh, in the building and now in the operation of the hotel. And this is the kind of restaurant that they have. All of these issues are uh, Egyptian handmade products. Uh, this is the second objective. When we started to assess why the why tourists select such kind of accommodation, and we have surveyed like 50 pers 50 person who have selected such kind of accommodation, and we started to uh, to ask them to to set a priority for the reason according to which they have selected such kind of accommodation, and the first reason was it is truly reflects the cultural heritage of the location. This means that the tourists they don't know they don't know uh, they don't want any more such kind of standardized service that can be found anywhere in the world. They want to feel the essence of the country, the essence of the village itself. And then the second reason was they have chosen this hotel because it provides them with a very unique experience, a story to tell behind. You know, each each uh, tourist want to tell. When, when he is going back to his country, want to tell a story about the destination. So the conclusion, and this is the last, I have taken... <laughs> Five two, oh. by the way. Uh? Two. <laughs> yes. You the time. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, <laughs> well, you are with people for 30 minutes. But we discriminate against men in the <laughs> We take it out, you know, has shifted from just being a place to have accommodation into selling experience 
we are trying to sell in the country itself through the accommodation. Uh, this, uh, it has, uh, this is considered a very good tool for promotion the cultural heritage of the hosting community. And this is actually, uh, what, what, what I can say that if we started, if you manage to benefit the local economy, if you manage to make the local, the local people feel that such a kind of heritage is very uh, beneficial for them, so you are trying to keep and maintain the heritage in another way. Because they will, very, they will be very careful to keep and maintain their heritage if something is, you know, if they get a, a considerable benefit from such heritage. Thank you very much. Contribute to the sustainability of the tourism sector and the reviving cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking over the chair. Uh, I'd like to congratulate both of us for this excellent presentation, good research, and I think we'll have good discussion. Professor, you like a lawyer, so if you don't follow the time, yeah, we will take you to the court. Uh, in academic field, in relate that goes to that area. So, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you know, I'm here a lecture at the uh, University of Essex. So, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Professor Vincenzo Aceri, if I should pronounce it correctly. Yes. Just uh, uh, a first uh, a consideration concerning tourism, uh, uh, film tourism phenomenon. Uh, as uh, you know, is uh, an increasing phenomenon in uh, the tourist market, and uh, it uh, encourage, uh, it is encouraged by the growth of entertainment uh, industry. And uh, uh, film tourism uh, is a form of tourism which brings visitors to places they have seen on the screen in film or uh, TV shows. Uh, in, uh, it can be studied and considered uh, from a different point of view because we have uh, the demand side, it means the consumer, uh, it means the, 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 the film tourist, uh, the place uh, where the, the movies are set. Uh, of course, we can uh, study the phenomenon in terms of uh, impact. I am uh, an economist and uh, I am uh, a microeconomic, so I study these uh, aspects and uh, of course as other colleagues can study uh, is important as uh, marketing and destination branding uh, strategy. Uh, film tourists plays an important role in directing uh, uh, tourist flows toward uh, destination. Uh, of course uh, it plays an important role in marketing uh, strategies. And what is uh, uh, known according to different studies is that uh, film tourists are well informed about the uh, location involved in the film. They are attracted, but they are uh, well, uh, well informed. So they choose, in terms of market, uh, the, the location according to what uh, they have seen on the uh, film or on the um, TV. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, marketing, in terms of uh, tourism uh, destination and uh, management, it is important uh, to underline that uh, the images in film increase the awareness of places represented in, uh, in them. Uh, so, in terms of uh, perception, 
and what is also important in terms of the process of shaping the images, because uh, as, some, uh, as uh, uh, normal happen, people have a shape of a place. It's not uh, really the, that image, but it's the shape of that image that is uh, uh, important in uh, determining the, the choice of, uh, um, of the, the choice in terms of destination. Uh, in uh, this uh, way and in general sense, uh, we uh, can say that uh, a film uh, contributes to the uh, place branding process and uh, films are able to create the uh, uh, meaning uh, of place. There is a lot of uh, um, literature concerning this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this topic. As you know, I just uh, uh, consider the, the, the study of this uh, uh, horrible. Uh, when we speak about uh, uh, the other side of uh, the, the, the film tourism, we, are, we have to focus on the concept of uh, authenticity. Uh, because uh, tourists are attracted by promises of authentic experience, when people are attracted to have uh, uh, an experience with uh, a local tradition, with this tradition, with, we know what is local. Uh, we, we know what is tradition, but sometimes uh, we uh, change something of our local tradition just to uh, appeal the, the, the market. So we transform in some way the uh, meaning of the, the, the word uh, authentic. Uh, so uh, the desire of authenticity means that the tourists are searching as, uh, something that is uh, connected with the, the, the destination. But uh, as uh, uh, Chabra uh, said in his uh, study, uh, authenticity uh, sometimes appears to be an elusive concept because it has uh, multiple uh, connotations. And uh, uh, it can be used in a different way uh, according to the, uh, the situation and uh, the, the context. In film tourists, the uh, idea of uh, authenticity uh, can be expressed in terms of a uh, constructivist approach. The constructivist approach uh, say that uh, the, the quality of authenticity relies in the eyes of the individual. So it's not something that is real and uh, authentic, but in the eye of the consumer is uh, really authentic. So it's uh, the, the, <clears throat> the result of a personal uh, interpretation. And in film induced uh, tourists, uh, the authenticity uh, is uh, correlated to the, the, the fantasy of the, uh, the spectator and the fantasy uh, at, the, at the end of the, <clears throat> the, uh, the tourist. Uh, the concept, uh, of course, can be used, uh, of course, uh, to uh, yes, okay, uh, can be used just to uh, build uh, tourist product according to the uh, the, the idea of uh, authenticity. Uh, I wish to uh, express this uh, idea, this concept, considering uh, the. Um, the Italian television uh, series Montalbano, maybe uh, some of us uh, know it uh, because I know that it is uh, just uh, in the uh, Greek uh, TV. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea of Montalbano started from uh, uh, novels and uh, um, uh, Camille that wrote the, these, these novels set these novels in a place that is an invented place that is called Vigata. The movie production uh, decided to set the movie in a big area of Sicily, the south of Sicily, that is characterized by the Baroque. Now a lot of towns of Sicily are, uh, for the tourists, the idea of Vigata. So, uh, we can call this uh, effect uh, Montalbano effect. As, as you know, you now see uh, a sign that say you go there and you see the place, the house of Montalbano, that it doesn't exist in the reality. So it's not authentic, but it's now authentic for the tourist. This is uh, 
a, a place uh, completely on the other side of the Sicily. This is uh, uh, more real, near Palermo, but for the Guardian it became the place where uh, is set Montalbano. So another place that became uh, authentic for the tourists, even if it's not authentic in the, uh, in the reality. And uh, of course, uh, all the product that uh, tourist product that are developed according to this uh, idea: uh, cooking, uh, go by bike, uh, walking uh, on the footstep of uh, Mont Alban. Uh, you see, we uh, we have visit Vigata like uh, Vigata, uh, uh, where a, a real place, but is not a real place. Uh, we have Vigata with the Salimunte Shaka. The Salimunte Shaka are authentic place, real place, but Vigata is not is in the idea of the tourist. So just uh, uh, in conclusion, sorry for uh, the, the time, uh, the importance of the, the image, as I said, uh, the importance of film tourism, uh, of film in general for uh, <coughs> uh, built a uh, destination image, and uh, the idea of the uh, authenticity that uh, in the film tourism is uh, a subjective and based on subjective <coughs> experience. Thank you very much. So let us continue the session with Professor Alfred Racine from the British University of Egypt again. How much? It was less with counting. Yeah, I did. I was perfectly right. It's actually in 1936. University in Egypt, uh, we have uh, our, you know, I'm just happy to be here with the, uh, the Etna. This will be an opportunity to raise a new issue, which is again, uh, I started 20 years ago, and it is all over the world, uh, especially when the time of Corona, as you can see, and there will be a comparison between uh, the Sphinx in Egypt and Sphinx which has already been in Luxor, Las Vegas, or uh, in many other places. So it's about civilization rights, it's a new concept, and responsible tourism. So I came from the British University within the Center of Sustainability and Future Studies. It is something like similar. We have to think about the sustainability of many different aspects. I'm architect and I'm planner, but again, with many issues related to uh, heritage and tourism, and already I will give the, the, the association uh, part of my uh, organization one. But again, this is the topic which again I hope this is the organization right. I yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If you can have the voice. What is civilization right? It is something similar to the copyright, but for civilizations. Okay, you have copyright for everything, but not for... The, the, he wants to increase the, 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 the volume. Ah, no, I need the volume. Ah, okay. Okay, I will give you the, the idea, because I thought that there would be a mic. But again, everything will have this kind of copyright. And it is a business all over the world. But if you come to those who really commercially benefit from our heritage and from the civilization, there will be no return. So it could be easily happen within uh, museums, when they exhibit like uh, the British Museum, they have the Rosetta Stone, or uh, Berlin, when they have the Vertiti, or the Metropolitan Museum, when they have the Dandur, they gain a lot, but in the front of that, the needed areas which they originally uh, come from, suffering a lot. So that was, came to my mind when I was doing my PhD, it was about Luxor, it's about public participation in the conservation of historic environments, and when I visited Lux in Las Vegas, I had these double feelings. I was very happy and very proud of my civilization, but I'm on the other side very frustrated. Why all those 
no benefit and gain a lot commercially, and on the other hand, there is no return from that. So that was the video. I will send it by another way, but it's a long story. It started by 1999, and now we are 2020, and it started by a visit to Luxor Las Vegas, then a conference at Argentine to have this versus Luxor Egypt versus Luxor Las Vegas. Then I started top down, try within the government and within the official, with the WIPO, within the, the UNESCO. Then I discovered that it's ended with a kind of law which is not giving us the rights because it is something debatable. And then I started after why to make it a bottom up rather to be top down, to make it a scientific debate. And successfully, it became one of the issues related to the National Academy of Science in Egypt for all disciplines, for the tourism, for the antiquities, for the media, for, for the investors, to say why not civilization right to be one of the new topics which could be a new challenge for all the international community to think about it. So that was the first, it is coming usually, that was 2004 when I was in Argentina, and this is kind of comparison between Luxor, Egypt, and Luxor, uh, Las Vegas. You can find everything as it is, they make it identical. And sometimes they say, why visit Egypt when you find everything in Luxor, Las Vegas? You find the tomb of Tutankhamun as Howard Carter discovered. So that means even when they said it could promote, no, it is on the other side, sometimes take from you the reality. I was using the, the issue of tourism as one of the, the main forces. And the, as you can see, if you go through uh, the, 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 the market, you'll find that they have every product and it is coming from inspiration of our heritage. But when I was looking for those different issues, I found here within the Greek law something that was very important for me. Because within the Greek law, we have that the use of any element of the Greek cultural heritage as a trademark or pattern or sample is strictly prohibited without the current permission of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture. So that was one of the only, and, and some a little bit with Mexico, are the only legal okay, uh, issues related to that one. When I was in, Ita in Italy uh, two, three, four years ago, they have with Adona a return from the Metropolitan Museum for this, and they tried to make again, like Hassan, when he said that there was. A, a, a local community tourist that we would like to connect within Sicily, the community to be hosting the tourists, and we are very proud that they already be able to have one of the statues there. So civilization right is a new concept, but it's not, again, uh, it is, could be one, one situation or win-win situation, and it is uh, within this initiative, it is, has a kind of research, it is campaign, again, it's kind of engagement. The research, we go through all the international laws and we discover that something could be with the tangible and tangible, but still it is not stated as it is, because they said that within the copyright, we need to know the creator, and it is already a civilization, which is there is no need to have, we have no idea who is the creator of this invention, but again, if you think about it on a different way, the Pepsi Cola company now, they have the secret, but it is already one to 120 years old, and so already they have this kind of uh, trademark and copy mark. So it is again began to be within different disciplines, a kind of science, and even there was within architecture, with planning, with law, with master's degree, many students are working on it. Within the campaign, I already have been in the different places within Egypt, so that was the first stage to have in civilization right, even it is not only looking for those who already commercial benefit from our heritage, but for us as an Egyptian to elevate, to be uh, adapted ourselves, to be equally related to this uh, civilization. I went to the United States, all over the United States, from many places, I went to 30 different cities and museums to raise the issue with this kind of acceptance, uh, with the American research, with the, the national, with the, the George Washington University, with different museums, and even with the Iraqi embassy. Uh, last month I was in India to, to have this issue. Again, we, we found that there are even have the, the pyramid is one of the, the, the inspiration of their uh, meditation places. Uh, so I was in London last 20 
days ago, and I, I, I was having this initiative, initiative with the British Museum, and have this kind, it is our right, it's not a fight, but it's going to be a kind of dialogue, and this is, again, you can find the souvenirs, it is not only for the Egyptian heritage and for all the different civilization, but again, it is made in China, it's not using the community or even the products which come from the, 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 the people themselves. So, the, the, the idea that it is not only me, it is now we make a kind of competition for ideas from all the Egyptians to think how we could have a dialogue with the international community asking for our rights. And these are different stories, but there is no uh, options to, to show, but there was very, very unique ideas, apps, movies, or even dialogue, and uh, uh, initiate a law or whatever. So that was even to make a play for, for, for to raise a community. It's something is going to take a bit long time. So the copyright took around 100 years to be stated. So the residential right, it will take time. It could be beyond my life, but we started uh, the, the, the story. Uh, uh, it is within the national competition. We have this kind of awareness with different things. And so why, why I'm here, especially this three, four years ago, the Greek here asked the international community and especially the ancient, ancient civilization to have this kind of uh, ancient civilization form. And that was very unique and we have the 10 old civilization. China, India, Iraq, Iran, Greece, Italy, Egypt, Bolivia, Mexico, Bureau. And they are 40% of the world. And they are thinking that how we could use the civilization and have the rights and have the return and economic return by one way or another. So that was the Prime Minister when he said cooperation of civilization against darkness of utmost importance. The Forum of Ancient Civilization is an important initiative which starts from Greece with the participation of civilizations that have left their mark in history. And the Prime Minister was mentioned that to everyone. So that was the difference in Egypt and Greece. They have this, uh, you know, dialogue, how we could start and when we could start with the international one. Uh, I created with the British Museum and something, uh, with the British University uh, Academic, but again, within the United States, I created the think tank under cephalizology. And this cephalizology, it's a new word, it's a new meaning to allow a platform to discuss the issue within the states and within other places. So that again return to what we meant by sustainable tourism. Sustainable tourism could be from top down or bottom up, but it has many other things, but especially the responsible tourism. Again, tourism, how it could play bottom up if I'm going to approach the community. I'm a person from Egypt, I would have approach of the international community. If we have government, it will take time, but if we don't have a kind of awareness and I ask everyone who's going to buy a ticket or a buy a souvenir or a buy a gift to be assured that the percentage of whatever he is going to, to, to pay is going to the original or the right, the, the civilization, to keep the civilization for the coming generations, I think this could be one of the, uh, the, the actions. And again, time by time, the law will be developed to accept that new concept which you are looking for. So responsibility towards resistance and resilience of communities surrounding touristic destination, elements or process increasing or preventing a community ability to avoid failure and all these things, and resilience elements or processes increasing a community speed uh, of recovery from the stresses or other hand. So this is again will be a new issues related to the uh, resilience. I was just returned from the National, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and I, I have this kind of platform. It is like uh, the one sterling or one euro to, to, be, to have uh, a, 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 a commercial uh, business. So this is again the platform here to make this kind of the GHP Green Heritage Platform from the handicrafts, this is a good part of the civilization right, it's a very slight part, how to use uh, the civilization right concept to, to save the communities from the people who are switching off or being out, that to reach the international community and the consumers, and especially the international museums, like the Louvre or the Rich Museum, or the that if you'd like to have a product, you'd like to have the souvenirs, the souvenirs, you have to be connected with the original and those people who already have this one. 
again, why we are here to introduce civilization rights and to establish a point of contact for further communication activities, discuss your views and thoughts, the heritage, tourism, cultural, political, economic, and other dimensions of what are we are doing, how to engage people on, on the international level and from different backgrounds. Next phase of the initiative. Already I have built a community and people and support within Egypt, but again with the international community, this is again we're going to be the second stage. I started with India, I started with Iraq, I started with Italy, I already have uh, within uh, th those, I hope that we're going to have within Greece, those who are going to support and be ambassadors for the issue. Again, this is the souvenirs of the Greek uh, uh, you know, units at the British Museum. To what extent they have a right to, to, to gain that much? And what is the return? This is again a question for all of you. Thank you, it's a long term. A long, a long road, but I'm sure that with all the international community and with the, the, the understanding and with a forum like this, we could have more and more ideas towards the issue. Thank you very much. But again, this is one thing that is top down. But what I prefer to think that from bottom up that we could share and have the same okay, uh, equal rights to talk about civilization yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.
benefits of a company with positive online reputation are increase in revenue. In my paper, impact of social media in hotel revenue in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, I show that when a hotel increase their online reputation in one unit, for example, from three to four, the hotel can increase the rate to in 0.5% without affecting the rev the rev part. Rev part is the revenue per available room. Another benefits are customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, customers increase attraction of better qualified employees, retention of the best employees, and customer loyalty. In my paper called Analysis of Hotel Bookings in Bogota during Anato 2016, I show these results about the customer loyalty. There are seven characteristics that stand out of for a company concerned with, a, with customer service, focusing first on the well-being of employees. These features are put the subordinates first, build relationships with subordinates, help subordinates develop and succeed, promote conceptual skills, empower subordinates, Maintain ethical behaviors within the company, creating value for those outside of the organization. This is just a summary of uh, many tips that I show in my paper, analysis of the reviews on social media to improve the online reputation in a hotel. Uh, I will show this research with objectives are Analyze the incidence of reviews of online reputation of hotels located in Latin America, case study, GH hotels. Monitor the channel through which more, re more reviews are received. Check if there is a relationship between the number of answers and position on TripAdvisor. Methodology. The research dates are where April 1st, 2018 to April 1st, 2019. Two years, the so far used was Revenue, and the hotel analyzed GHL hotels located in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, and Peru. These are the GHL hotels. Results. We can see that the channel more used for the case with who leave uh, their reviews is Google with almost 40,000 reviews. The second channel is Booking with almost 14,000 reviews and the third is TripAdvisor with almost 10,000. Why is this important? Well, because if I know that Google is the most important channel where our guests are writing, asking, and waiting for information, I can focus my digital marketing strategies for our guests. Well, uh, in this slide, I show you the 12 hotels with first position of our hotel chain, hotel chain, and this is the other eight hotel, hotels with the second position in triple pass. We can see that all the reviews are answered. When the hotel answers the reviews, the hotel goes up in triple pass. But why is it important to be in the first position in the device? Well, because when a guest is looking for a, for booking in a hotel, he goes to the advisor and just 18% of the guests go to the second page. Just they are looking in the first page. This is a study of my hotel, uh, an enterprise which 
measure the online reputation. Conclusions. Currently, the review tool that is used the most by those who write comments on hotels on the internet is Google. It receives 57.9% of the reviews. The second channel that receives the most reviews is Booking.com with 21.4% of the comments. And the third channel is TripAdvisor with 13.8% of the comments. The most significant fact is that the sum of these three channels is the 93.2% of all comments received. This information is relevant for small holders because if they can afford paying for a software that measures the online reputation, they can just monitor the data from these three channels to identify the satisfaction level from the guest and improve their efforts to reach their quality standards. When the hotel answers a review, it also answers the question of its potential guests. Low property prices, but most importantly, we don't have 
a regulated framework, at least not as regulated as compared to hotels. So, what's the market? The Greek market about certain rentals, I'm talking about, comprises mostly of flats within multi-story buildings. That's the traditional Airbnb or something kind of buy. So we have some weak competition for certain rentals from long-term rentals, traditional civil services. But uh, it's more close competition where we're talking about hotels or other alternative forms of tourism. But the strongest competitor would be rooms to let, a quasi-hotel sort of business allowed by Greek law. And the demand, of course, is quite big, domestic and international, and still increasing. Now, having said that, the properties are usually situated within multi-story buildings, condominiums, if you like. Uh, it comes as no surprise that problems of noise, loitering, occupation of communal areas might arise, which might be also augmented by the frequency of tenants coming in and going out of that particular Airbnb or uh, sort of method, if you like. And uh, of course, uh, some neighbors have complained that the cultural character has been mutated and that it is insecure and so on and so forth. Now, this of course, as usual, happens in Greece and this dispute will eventually lead to court. So, that's the, uh, the reason why we're going to talk today's topic is that we have the very early decisions on that topic and they are all at first instance. So we have nothing conclusive yet, but we can draw some conclusions on ourselves. So I'm going to focus on the uh, Nafile Court of Resistance decision and the Athens Court of Resistance decision uh, as they are highlighted here. So in Nafile, we had sort of typical Greek host, and by Greek I don't mean the host being of Greek nationality, a host invested in Greece in the way that I described before. So an owner of a, a flat of 103 square meters big, uh, registered on a well-known platform, that flat, and provided services, that's very important, that went beyond the traditional uh, uh, short-term accommodation in the strict sense as defined in Greek tax law. So, uh, C provided them with guided tours, C provided them with breakfast, and so on and so forth. Now, the neighbors complained that, well, the visitors come and go and create a nuisance, they were loitering communal areas, uh, they were occupied, uh, occupying uh, allocated parking spaces, so on and so forth. So, the claim was brought by almost all of the co-owners of the building. All but one. So, uh, legal grounds on that claim were one, nuisance, second, simply violating the multi-story building condominium regulation, which expressly prohibited the operation of a hotel within the premises. That's a big question. Do we consider an Airbnb or any sort of rental to be a hotel? So the decision said that the landlady, the host in that case, the hostess in that case, ran the business akin to a hotel. Now, that's not perfectly legally sound. Akin might be considered not to be enough to restrict uh, basically an activity that is based on the constitutional right, the enjoyment of property. But further problems with that decision are located elsewhere, where we read that the respondent proceeded to register the aforementioned property at the website's brand name as Heuristic Business Accommodation Facility. So a reader, any reader, might get the impression that courts actually consider certain rentals to be touristic activity. Is that the case? Probably not. And that's why the next decision on the same topic that was released shortly after, a few weeks later, uh, said quite the contrary as regards it. So, 
In uh, after school of resistance, we had a very similar factual background. I mean, even the size is almost identical. We're talking about the last uh, difference. But the significant difference there was that the multi story building condominium regulation prohibited to run an ecotrophil. Now, ecotrophil literally translated in Greek and, well, uh, it means door for students. Furthermore, that's the legal sense of that term. So, of course, the court said that the hostess did not run in Cotterfield. So, was the law misapplied to them? No. They were right. That term has very specific meaning. So, there was no reason, no ground to prohibit uh, that landlady. Uh, from running their Airbnb and uh, a certain rental. However, uh, by reading the decision, one might say that the uh, the applicants in the case, uh, well, plaintiffs in the case, uh, could stand a better chance if they based their claim on the ground that, well, according to the condominium regulation, any disturbance. Uh, could be prohibited if it's unheard. However, that would run the risk that the court would consider this business to be an ordinary sealed rental and therefore be very difficult to provide them with a prohibition to run the such. So, the, the, uh, the interesting part there in this decision is that it went to say obiter that certain rentals do not constitute touristic businesses in stark contrast with the previous one. Now, that's true. I mean, where it's different from rooms to let, but as we said in the beginning, we have different categories and we have also the possibility of abuse. What if a de jure sort of rental operates as de facto touristic business? That was not considered, and that might be problematic if we strictly apply the reasoning of Athens uh, Court of Assistance, I think it's 1259 slash 2019. So some points to make on that. The panic that was created when the Daphne decision was issued was to an extent exaggerated. No one prohibited, no court prohibited short term rental singers. That was absolutely made clear by the subsequent decision from the Athens Court of Persistence. Running short term rental business is not the ipso facto for Hebrew. Now, uh, rather, we have two decisions that look antithetic, prima facie, but are not. They were based on different factual backgrounds. The wording of the condominium regulation is key, and practically, neighbors might, I mean, co-owners or within the same multi-story building might consider uh, amending the regulation. Uh, so buyers beware. They might buy, they may try to invest in something that they cannot lease as Airbnb or short-term rental, etc. And from the short-term uh, landlords or hosts standpoint, it's necessary to keep a close oversight on how it operates. So we have broader implications from that. Look. So both decisions show that rather than the fact that touristic business may have legal implications, you see also the potential of private enforcement, uh, private enforcement in combating abuse. Now, under Greek law, touristic accommodation is subject not only to several regulations specific to the nature and size of the business, but also to the different tax treatment and of course, the quality by visitors reviews, as might be counter argued by certain rentals, might not be. Right, right. Exactly. That's what is the point. Exactly. So I'm going to jump to the conclusions. Those reviews are malleable, they are ex post factor. I'm not going to go into the details of the differential treatment that proper touristic businesses undergo. You all know that. They have to comply with health and safety, to with uh, planning regulations, and so on and so forth. I would just go to my 
point going against the platform is difficult and particularly so given that we have the decision by the European, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union in uh, late 2019 uh, saying that Airbnb is providing information society services, it's not a real thing or anything they like. So my proposal would be that to strike the problem of abuse that I described at its heart by simply treating certain rentals which de facto are hotels or rooms to let as such. Simple as that. The problem with that it might lead to a deregulation to a race to the bottom and of course someone might argue how we're we going to enforce them. That might be true when it comes to public enforcement but as I showed with the decisions, private enforcement might come to the rescue, meaning that the private parties that are annoyed by such behavior might bring such problems to the fore. Thank you for your attention. Even though I was absent for a few minutes outside, I was discussing touristic things. I was hearing the voices of the speakers, so. I, I, I was doing two things. Now, I think we have succeeded in minimizing the required time to enlighten ourselves, and we we'll still have time to rest before 6.30, and uh, we'll give the opportunity to our other participants if they want to say something very important. If it's important, forget it, but if it's very important, we can do it. Extremely, Extremely important, as you can understand. So you have something to say so it can be recorded for the eternity. And uh, after 2,000 years, they will say that this person said something important. Say, not the speakers, only the participants. Are there any questions? Do you want to say something? Because you could do that? Yeah. If not, what we're going to do is the following. We're going to stay outside and uh, have coffee and relax, mm -hmm. and then we discuss. And we convene again, not in this room, upstairs, at 6.30. Please be there 6.29. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So you have time to rest up there. Thank you. Thank you.